I recently met a Darwinist on the internet who refused to even debate the issue of evolution with me since he believed, quote unquote, evolution is just as much scientific fact as is the law of gravity. Yet, besides the fact that the 1 in 10 to the 40 finely tuned gravitational constant is to be considered miraculous in its own right, and besides the fact that Isaac Newton himself held the agent causality of God to be behind the gravitational constant, And besides the fact that we wind up in catastrophic epistemological failure if we deny the agent causality of God and naively attribute agent causality to inanimate objects, and besides the fact that the double split experiment in quantum electrodynamics both provide us with fairly compelling evidence that the infinite mind of God is indeed upholding this entire universe in its continual existence. Besides all those minor details, Darwinian evolution is certainly not just as much a scientific fact as is the law of gravity. Far from it. In fact, as David Malinsky points out in, this, in the following quote, Darwinian evolution does not even qualify as a testable theory. But Darwinian evolution is instead, to the consternation of atheists, more realistically classified as an unfalsifiable pseudoscience. This follow, following video makes this that point clear. Moreover, science is supposed to, first and foremost, reliably separate fact from fiction and to reveal the true nature of reality to us. But as is shown in the following video, for the atheist who forsakes God, all of reality itself collapses into unrestrained flights of fantasy and imagination. Darwinian evolution in particular is, in large measure, as Stephen J. Gould himself admitted, almost totally reliant on fictional stories, also known as just-so stories instead of being reliant on any compelling experimental evidence. In fact, the late Professor Philip Skell stated that Darwin's theory provided no discernible guidance for the outstanding bio-discoveries of the past century, but was brought in after the breakthroughs as an interesting narrative gloss. Here are a few more references that get this evolution brought in as a narrative gloss after interesting bio-discoveries were made. Point across. And Darwinian evolution, despite vehement protests from Darwinists to the contrary, simply has no observational evidence to substantiate the claim from Darwinist that it is as much a scientific fact as is the law of gravity. In fact, in my honest opinion, evolution is completely bankrupt of any substantiating experimental evidence. For instance, despite much uh, much in misinformation on the internet, it turns out that Darwinists have not even demonstrated the origin of a single new species, which is interesting since Darwin's book itself was entitled On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. In 1997, 
evolutionary biologist Keith Stewart Thompson wrote, A matter of unfinished business for biologists is the identification of evolution's smoking gun. And the smoking gun of evolution is speciation, not, ad, not local adaptation or differentiation of populations. And here is a detailed refutation by Casey Luskin to talk origins severely misleading internet site on the claimed evidence for observed examples of macroevolution and or speciation. And here are several more references that refute the claim from Darwinists that speciation has been observed. Perhaps the most telling piece of evidence that clearly demonstrates Darwinists have no substantiating evidence for their claims of macroevolution comes from the study of microbes. As Alan H. Linton, Emeritus Professor of Bacteriology at the University of Bristol stated, But where is the ex experimental evidence? None exists in the literature claiming that one species has been shown to evolve into another. Bacteria, the simplest form of independent life, are ideal for this kind of study, with generation times of 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, and populations achieved after 18 hours. But throughout 150 years of, of the science of bacteriology, there is no evidence that one species of bacteria has changed into another. And here is a video that goes into more detail about the scientific evidence from microbes that falsifies Darwinian claims for macroevolution. Moreover, not only have Darwinists failed to demonstrate the origin of a new species or even the origin of a new bacteria, Darwinists have not even demonstrated the origin of a single new protein by Darwinian processes. Here are a few references that make this point clear. And here is another article by Dr. Cornelius Hunter that reveals that for any given protein, only a few changes to its amino acid sequence can be sustained before the protein function is all but eliminated. Moreover, not only have Darwinists failed to demonstrate the origin of even a single gene and or protein by unguided Darwinian processes, Darwinists, with their reliance on randomness, do not even have a real clue how a protein might achieve its final folded state. The, uh, the mystery of protein folding is referred to as the Leventhal Paradox. Simply put, the Leventhal Paradox is the fact that a relatively small protein of only 100 amino acids can take some 10 to the 100 different configurations. If it tried all these shapes at the rate of a hundred billion a second, it would take longer than the age of the universe to find the correct one. Just how these molecules do the job in nanoseconds, nobody knows. Moreover, as the preceding article also pointed out, the most plausible explanation for how proteins folded in 
fold into their final shape is that protein folding is actually a quantum mechanical affair and is not a classical affair as is presupposed in Darwinian thinking. In fact, as the following video shows, quantum biology actually falsifies the randomness postulate that undergirds Darwinian theory. Moreover, it is also important to realize that finding quantum correlations on a massive scale in molecular biology in every DNA and protein molecule, as these following references show, also falsifies another primary tenet of Darwinian evolution. Namely, finding quantum entanglement and or quantum information on a massive scale in molecular biology falsifies the primary Darwinian claim that the information found in molecular biology is not really real information but is a quote unquote metaphor for information that only looks like information. Specifically, quantum information is now shown to be its own independent physical entity that is separate from matter and energy and is not emergent from a material basis as is presupposed in Darwinian thought. In fact, classical, differ classical digital information, such as what William Dembski and Robert Marx demonstrated conservation of, in other words, classical digital information, such as what we find encoded in computer programs, and yes, as we find encoded in DNA, that classical inform digital information found in computers and in DNA is now found to be a subset of quantum information by the following method. And the preceding work has now been experimentally verified to prove that information is indeed physically real and is indeed, contrary to Darwinian presuppositions, independent of matter and energy. Moreover, in quantum mechanics, information cannot be created nor destroyed. That is to say that in quantum mechanics, it is information itself that is primarily conserved, not necessarily matter and energy that are primarily conserved, as they are primarily conserved in classical mechanics. But most importantly, it is important to realize that quantum information is a non-local, beyond space and time effect. Specifically, quantum correlations somehow arise from outside space-time in the sense that no story in space and time can describe them. Simply put, every time a DNA or protein molecule is formed and new quantum correlations are being utilized by them, then, of necessity, new quantum information must somehow be coming into the biological system from outside space-time. To repeat, quantum correlations somehow arise from outside space-time in the sense that no story in space and time can describe them. To a Christian theist, this beyond space and time finding for molecular biology should not be all that surprising. In fact, according to Psalm 139.13, a Christian theist should have expected, even predicted, this finding all along. 
Moreover, besides DNA and protein molecules, at about the 40 minute mark of the following Design Beyond DNA video, Dr. Jonathan Wells demonstrates that during embryological development, information must somehow be added to the developing embryo from the outside by some non-material method. Again, this is a finding that Christian theists should have expected, even predicted, all along. Many people, particularly Darwinists, argue that God cannot possibly have a hand in embryological development due to birth defects and such things as that. But it is important to realize that birth de defects and mutations in general are actually first and foremost scientific evidence against Darwinian evolution being true and are, contrary to, Darwin, to what Darwinists may think, not scientific evidence against God having a hand in embryological development. In fact, in the twisted world of Darwinian theology, Dr. John Avice used birth defects and detrimental mutations in general, which are actually powerful scientific arguments against Darwinian evolution being true, as a theological argument for Darwinism since, according to Darwinian theology, God would never allow such things as birth defects and detrimental mutations. Elsewhere in his book, A Case for Non-Intelligent Design, I found that Dr. Avice stated that there are more than 75,000 different disease-causing mutations identified to date in Homo sapiens. And then I went to the mutation database website cited by Dr. John Avice and found that the number of detrimental mutations has now been updated, updated to a total of over 200,000. Yet, contrary to what Dr. Avesi and other Darwinists in general may believe, such an overwhelming rate of detrimental mutations in the human genome is not a point of evidence in favor of Darwinism. In fact, it is a very powerful scientific argument against Darwinian claims that this scientific fact would even have to be pointed out to Darwinists is a sad testimony to how warped Darwinian theology truly is in regards to honestly evaluating the actual science at hand. In the following article, Dr. John Sanford clearly lays out what the scientific implications truly are of such an overwhelming rate of detrimental mutations. Thus, no matter how much we may personally dislike birth defects and mutations in general, birth defects simply are not scientific evidence against God having a hand in embryological development. Using birth defects to argue against God is a theological argument that is based on personal subjective opinions as to what God would and would not do in this universe. As far as the scientific evidence itself is concerned, what we do have is, to repeat, evidence of quantum correlations coming into biological systems from outside space-time. And again, this beyond space and time finding for biology is to be expected, even predicted, by Christian theists. Moreover, embryological development, where one cell transforms into the approximately 37 trillion cells that comprise the human body, gives us every indication that God forms us in our mother's womb. At the seven and a half minute mark of the following video, Alexander Ciaris 
in regards to embryological development states that the magic of the mechanisms inside each genetic structure saying exactly where that nerve cells should go, the complexity of these, the mathematical models on how these things are indeed done are beyond human comprehension. Even though I am a mathematician, I look at this with the marvel of how these instruction sets do not make these mistakes as they build what is us. It is a mystery. It's magic. It's divinity. Another piece of evidence that provides fairly strong empirical evidence of God creating a soul within our human body comes from four-dimensional quarter power scaling. In four-dimensional quarter power scaling, we find that there is a mysterious higher dimensional component to life. As Jerry Fodor noted, all living things occupy a three-dimensional space. Their internal physiology and anatomy operate as if they were four-dimensional. The driving force of these invariant scaling laws cannot have been natural selection. The reason why four-dimensional quarter power scaling laws are impossible for Darwinian evolution to explain is because natural selection operates on the three-dimensional level of the organism and the four-dimensional quarter power scaling laws are simply invisible to natural selection. The reason why four-dimensional things are, for all practical purposes, completely invisible to three-dimensional objects is best illuminated by the following video entitled Flatland. Though Jerry Fodor and Palomarini rightly find it inexplicable for natural selection to be the rational explanation for why three-dimensional organisms are constrained to four-dimensional parameters, they do not seem to fully realize the implications this four-dimensional scaling presents. This four-dimensional scaling is something we should rightly expect from it and an intelligent design perspective since intelligent design holds that higher dimensional information is more foundational to life and even to the universe itself than matter and energy are. Here are a few quotes that get this information is foundational point across. This higher dimensional expectation for life from an intelligent design perspective is directly opposed to the expectation of the Darwinian framework which erroneously held that information was merely an emergent property of the three-dimensional material realm. Moreover, as would be expected under a de design perspective, the brain's metabolic rates scale to one-sixth parameters instead of scaling to one-quarter parameters as the rest of the body does. The preceding findings are very unexpected for materialists since materialists hold that mind is merely an emergent property of the physical processes of the brain. But why should the mind which is presupposed to be, to be the result of and subservient to the material processes of the brain, constrain the material brain to operate at such a constant and optimal one-sixth metabolic rate, whereas the rest of the body has a baseline of one-quarter scaling. The most parsimonious explanation for such an optimal constraint on the brain's metabolic activity is that the material brain was designed first and foremost to house the immaterial mind and to give the immaterial mind the most favorable of metabolic environments at all times. 
Moreover, the human brain, by all rights, should settle the intelligence design evolution debate once and for all. The human brain is an engineering marvel that evokes comments from researchers like beyond anything they'd imagine, almost to the point of being beyond belief, and a world we had never imagined. For instance, it is found that a single human brain has more information processing units than all the computers, routers, and internet connections on Earth, and that the brain's memory capacity is in the same ballpark as the World Wide Web. As well, a computer processor functioning with the computational capacity of the human brain would require at least 10 megawatts to operate properly. This is comparable to the output of a small hydroelectric power plant. Moreover, fully analyzing the possible interactions of the 1,000 proteins within a single neuronal synapse would take about 2,000 years even though it is assumed that the underlying technology analyzing that neuronal synapse speeds up by an order of magnitude each year. Much the same astonishing complexity that is found in the human brain is also to be found for the rest of the human body. Dr. Hired Howard Glucksman has an 81-part series of articles reveal, revealing the fact that the human body is, like the brain, an engineering marvel. In conclusion, I've been debating Darwinist for a number of years now, and it is simply beyond my comprehension how any atheist can be so blind to and even angrily deny the handiwork of God that is more than evident in their very own bodies. As J. Homnick, senior editor of the American Spectator, once put it, it's, it is not enough to say that design is the more likely scenario to explain a world full of well-designed things. Once you allow the intellect to consider that an elaborate organism with trillions of microscopic interactive components can be an accident, you have essentially lost your mind. Well, that is the end of the video, and again, all videos and papers referenced in this video may be accessed in the link provided in the video description. Thank you again very much for watching.